I want to see like Transformers, but they're all in the shape of Michael Bay. <laughs> they're just fighting each other. <laughs> the Michael Bay form. <laughs> Every time they step or punch or touch anything, it explodes. That's good shit. All right, can we get the show on the road? Ah, fuck, I guess. What is up, nerds and nerds? Welcome to another episode of Thinking and Drinking. Now, this week, we're going to do things a little bit differently. This week, we are going to delve into the summer 2016 preview. And just like everything on this episode, we're going to be previewing video games, comics, and movies. But rather than doing one episode and trying just to get so bloated and jam full of all this content so that nothing gets, you know, covered with any detail, we're going to break this up into like three mini episodes. Mm -hmm. We're going to cover comic books this episode, video games the next, and finally, movies in our last episode. So, let's... Let's go ahead and dive right into it. We're talking about summer of 2016 for comic books. It kind of becomes a difficult conversation, and that's because DC has kind of handcuffed us by refusing to tell us absolutely anything about Rebirth, which is a huge part of their entire plan for the year. So, and we and we also talked about what little there was to talk about on last week's episode. So, if you want to kind of get our thoughts on uh, what we think Rebirth will be or could be, go back watch last week's episode. And like and share, yeah, and then several hundred times, and just watch it over and over. Yeah, and yeah. Play it on loop. put it on loop. Anyway, fuck it. Let's just kind of final thoughts on Rebirth, having knowing nothing else. The big thing with Rebirth is yes, we don't know what it's going to be conceptually, but ultimately that doesn't matter until we know what the creative teams are going to be, and that's a big thing they're still holding back from us. The, there has been some rumors coming out. The two big ones are Tom King on Batman and Scott Snyder on Detective Comics. Now, the, Scott, the Snyder one is pretty much going to happen, and the Tom King one is just kind of group thought. It's, it's going to happen. Now, I think that's the best choice because if, one, if there's one weakness that DC has is its stable of young talent is a little bit depleted at this point. Letting Jeff Lemire and Charles Soule walk out the door, I think, was a big, big mistake for them. Now, Tom King is probably the one young guy they have locked down exclusively. And if you're going to have that one young talent, definitely put him on your strongest book, I would think. Yeah, that would be a great idea. And you heard it here first, yes, guys. Yes, breaking, I mean, uh, AJ says it's breaking news happen. we made up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as far as that, like, yeah, there's been some rumblings, even some artwork that Jim Lee is getting back into working on comics again, and specifically with Suicide Squad, which is... Uh, yes, kind of, that's not a rumor, is it? I thought that yeah, was Yeah, we've actually uh, seen official. some art, so I'm pretty sure that's going to be official. How tied, that, how tied okay. in with Rebirth that actually is, is I'm not 100% sure on. And... And the writer is, is it Rob? It's the person writing the current Martian Manhunter series? I'm not 100% sure who the writer is, because honestly, anytime you mention Jim Lee, unless the writer is Frank Miller, it's going to get kind of blown up. <laughs> to okay. be completely honest. I, yeah. I, I, I know I, I read who the writer is. I think is, it's but... the writer of Martian Manhunter, and I'm forgetting his name, but I think it's Rob or Ron or something. Um, but I hear the Martian Manhunter series right now is pretty good. So uh, that... That's a good sign, uh, considering the last... I mean, everything Suicide Squad in the New 52 has pretty much been uh, not very good. Yeah, it's, it's been kind of uh, underwhelming. And I think they kind of want to get that property back on track before they launch the movie. Because you're yeah, going to have yeah. an influx of people wanting to figure out... Got to have a big buzz. Yeah, got to make that synergy. Between Synergize. <laughs> Company. Big intern. Synergy. CEOs. Yeah, so... <sighs> That's going to be interesting to see, but as far as Rebirth, it's really, it's so hard to talk about it beyond here until we get actually some more information. Yeah, it's been two weeks since we did the Rebirth episode, and really nothing, nothing has come out from and, it. And uh, I guess I guess until it does, we're going to have to kind of be in a holding pattern on that. So, yeah. moving on, now Marvel is kind of doing the same thing with their Summer six, uh, 16 plans, and that, that we know that Civil War II is happening and that all the books and titles are pretty much going to be based around that what silver war 2 is is a little bit still unknown what we do know is that the two sides are basically going to be shepherded by iron man just like it was in the first civil war and captain marvel and we know that's going to start off with it's going to be based around sort of that uh, minority report argument is it okay to punish people before crimes happen and blah, blah, blah. and it's going to be it's going to be kicked off with the death of a character and that's really where the big conversation when you're talking about this about this event book is, is who are they going to kill? And there's some sort of detective work we can do on that first cover they released. They show this episode of like a dude on fire in the middle. And that figure you could you know, assume is the person who's going to die. 
Um, all we all we know for sure is it's not Spider-Man and it's not Human Torch because the report came out uh, talking about their process and those were the first two they thought of and the first two they axed. I thought for sure it was going to be Human Torch. I thought that made so they would they would kill the Human Torch by setting him on fire. He's not on fire exactly. <laughs> <laughs> to death. I don't know. That'd be like too obvious. It's just it's it's just the most the vaguest figure, uh, you know, in, uh, enlightened by fire and it's just. You can't draw anything from that. It's just it, it could be anyone. Yeah, and it's literally just a male silhouette, basically, and then this this pillar yeah. of fire. So <sighs> And and it's really exploring brand new territory here. Who's gonna die, you know, and like hero versus hero. We've never seen this. Well, before. and that's my entire problem with what we've seen so far in this event, is nothing seems that interesting. It just all feels yeah. from the title to the structure to the things the, the being... The title especially, yeah. really, like Civil War Two. I mean, how, how on the nose can you get about trying to bank in on the movie and bank in on the past event's success? Well, and, like, there was so much interesting about the first Civil War. You know, it came at a time in our country where the conversation about uh, civil liberties and being protected by the government was very much a thing that was in the forefront of everyone's mind, and that was so much what that story was about. So it was relevant, it was deep, it had something to say, and it was really interesting and really, really well put together. This one just seems to be put together, period. Yeah, yeah. and you have... You have Bendis writing it, and when is the last time Bendis wrote a satisfying event? Do we know? Yeah, and that's the other thing. Like, what else has uh, Bendis written? Oh, Bendis is Bendis is a writing machine. He okay, essentially writes enough. everything. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. it, I'm pretty sure he's a brain in a vat at this point, and the stories just come <laughs> out of Futurama. it. Super Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and well, like he wrote Ultimate Spider-Man for a million years. He, I think that's the longest run in comic book history. That, uh, oh, he wow. did that. And uh, he was the last shepherd of the X-Men series. He wrote all the X-Men series. And Yeah, he yeah. did a lot of the X-Men events like Battle of the Atom. Okay. Battle of the Atom. Um, uh, the Trial of Jean Grey, is that one? Yeah, and... It, <laughs> Okay. He, did, he was the last guy to do uh, Guardians and, of the Galaxy, stuff like yeah, that. He, mm. uh, and he also did the Age of Ultron event, which is known to be, like, one of the worst Marvel Yeah, one events. of the most built-up and least satisfying events. And, and that was something else yeah. that... <laughs> and that, that's what's happening right well, now, is building up for Civil War II, and I'm just... I'm expecting the same unsatisfying... Well, the thing is, I don't necessarily think it's fair, like, okay, Civil War II, let's immediately compare it to Civil War. But when they named it that, they invited that... that Controversy. They invited yeah. that. Yeah. So, let's let's do that. First thing, I think Civil War sort of launched the golden age of Marvel event books because Civil War rolled into Secret Invasion, which rolled into Dark Reign. Like, everything kind of felt very connected. It felt very planned. All these event books recently have just felt very stuck on to each other. Like, uh, especially things like Infinity that just felt like they were killing time. It's like, ah, we need an event book this summer, so let's just... um, Thanos is probably doing something bad. We should stop. <laughs> you, you know, it, 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 and, and they just don't feel. They feel so unwieldy and unfocused, and it also feels just so very overtly tied into what they're doing in the movies. And that's what makes me think that whoever dies is probably going to be a Fox-owned property character. Like I, 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 I just really feel in my heart. God, yeah, like that's that's a good. Observation. That is actually that's probably going to happen. Yeah, on. and my theory is I know this kind of goes against. The theory we just put forward that whoever's in the middle of that fire pillar is the guy who's going to die. But I think it's going to be Jean Grey, this new young Jean Grey. I think they're going to kill her because if there's one thing that Fox, lo- that, uh, excuse me, Marvel loves to do, it's kill Jean Grey. And uh, <laughs> a, a lot of the new publicity, like uh, I think the last image that dropped to promote Civil War II was Phoenix centric. And uh, so that's personally my thought. Um, I know this new Nova has not been particularly well received. The new Nova they're using, I wouldn't be surprised if they killed him. Uh, you could also th- kind of make assumptions and think maybe Winter Soldier because it ties into the movie. You could make those kind of assumptions too. War Machine because we see based off marketing material for the Civil War movie, War Machine might die in the movie, so that would be synergy there as well. I don't like that. So, right, because, yeah. I don't like how they have they, to they have to synergize with the movie. So, I, I don't like it either, like but that. they have been doing yeah. it since Spider-Man 3. They've been doing it for a really, really long time. I didn't know they did that yeah. well, way back. Okay. Yeah, because I remember they had that really vestigial back and black storyline where they put Peter Parker in the black suit again for completely contrived reasons just because the movie that was coming out also had him in the like, black suit. Like, when they... Now, I haven't... Obviously, I haven't kept up with, like, Secret Wars yeah. or any of that. Um... In fact, right now I'm rereading all the Punishers 
And oh yeah, he's having a, he's having himself a, a, a Garth Ennis fest right now. It's he awesome. It's it. awesome. <laughs> and weird. Oh, so you're in Punisher Max. Yeah, I'm in then. A, I've heard that series is it's, fantastic. It, it's probably the best one like that I've read. How are you reading that? Do you have the trades? No, or comicsology. Because yeah, com- yeah, comicsology. Okay, cool, it's cool. it's really good. But anyways, uh, that being said, though, if something happens in the movie, do they rehash it in the comics, or is it just like, oh, you have to see the movie to really make this connection? They no, they connect it in um, the most superficial way they can. So yeah, it doesn't. Exactly, so if right. you don't see the movie, you don't. You're not lost. No, but like I remember when Thor: The Dark World came out. Mm-hmm. That was in the middle of the first Jason Aaron Thor run, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden Malekith is the bad guy. Okay. In the movie and in the comics, not doing anywhere close to the same thing. Not even really characterized in the same way. But by putting the character in the forefront of the comics and the forefront of the movie, all of a sudden you're creating a very manufactured synergy there. And to give Jason Aaron credit. That was an amazing run, and he did some cool stuff with Malekith that he's still doing now in current Thor. So it worked out fine. And even if you look back at uh, when Matt Fraction started his run on Invincible Iron Man when the movies were launching, he was pushing <clears throat> the Ironmonger's son to the forefront of the okay. villain thing. So like they're kind of always trying to connect it there. A yeah, I bit. think it's just their attempts to, to kind of market it. You get people, maybe, maybe a small amount of people seeing these movies are come into the comic shops and the, they're gonna they're gonna get what looks familiar so if they just watched the they movie kind of, they aren't lost um, like you said with thor thor the dark world and if, if they somehow enjoyed that then they'll come to the comic book shop and see just jason aaron's comic book uh, with with similar characters in it, and it similar similar events happening and then that's going to be more intriguing to them than something that's completely uh confusing like the walking and, dead uh contrived. well and <laughs> well, they're completely <laughs> well that's almost a completely different conversation how those two properties have made themselves unapproachable that, I, I, I guess but, that's yeah true. but comic books are so unapproachable it's just that little thing like oh i recognize the guy on that cover can go a huge way to yeah. get someone to read exactly. it because i'm gonna read it and silver war is so trying to <laughs> like capitalize on that especially i think it's kind of sneaky too because i put in a second number on it it almost feels like Oh, I already saw the first half of it, so I can just jump right in here. Yeah, yeah <laughs> right. you, you know, so it's kind of... I want to see the story continue. Double mindfuckery. And so... Mind quad. I, I have a hard time criticizing Marvel too much for the way it's uh, approached its properties, uh, especially when it, even when it's doing very, like, transparently quasi-sinister things. Like, when they change their entire Avengers lineup to look like a Benetton ad... So that, oh, we have every race and color, and there's a Lady Thor now. And I, and, and I, have, I have a hard time getting angry about that, even though it is very transparent yeah. in making decisions that are not entirely creatively some, based. Some yeah. weird invisible quota. But everything's been so good. Right. And so I have a hard time being angry about it, because, like, oh, the books are still good. Like, if they were shit, I could have a lot easier time being angry. Like, you guys lost focus. You're trying to turn everything into a message instead of just making great comic books. But they're still making great comic books. And if Civil War II ends up being great, well, fuck, they got away with it. Having, having Yeah, that, that's yeah. what matters. And having said that, very little from what I've seen gives me a feeling that it's going to be great. And one thing that I think is very underrated is I think Brian Michael Bendis gets shit on a lot more than he should just because he's kind of the Tom Brady of comic books. Because he's doing everything, he's doing everything pretty well, and he has so a moat. yeah, <laughs> and he's and he's so successful, and he's become you know one of the rock stars of the industry. Right, that it, it's hard. The farther out front you are, the easier they hate to, us because they hate us kind yeah. of situation. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But at the same time, I feel like that golden era of event books that I talked about earlier, a lot of the reason that worked is there was a rotating like shepherd through each individual event. You know, mm-hmm. Mark Miller got Civil War, and I, I forgot who was ahead of Secret Wars, excuse me. but And they were even doing that up to recently. I mean, uh, Remender got Access, and Jason Aaron got Original Sin. And there's always a different person leading. I feel like Brian Michael Vendis has gotten his event book so many times over that I would love to see if, I don't know, Nick Spencer or Jeff Lemire or someone else was given a chance to sort of tell their universe-spanning story. Um, I know they're in a... Mo- kind of in a time of where they're like there's a creative turnover at that company so that oh excuse me so that stuff's coming eventually but it's just like god i really have never while i like a lot of my uh Bendis's work i've never really liked any of his event books i thought they've always been sort of just kind of all over the place yeah. and he you know as 
Go ahead. Sorry, go well, ahead. Well, I think his strengths are he's very good in like very small moments. And that he's very good, like bouncy conversations, very quiet character moments. And those do not present themselves a lot in big universe banding event books. Oh, no. Like he pioneered the decompression style, mm-hmm. right? Of just kind of making everything just kind of really slow and all about these character moments. And so when you're dealing with an event where people are expecting big things to happen all the time, and then they read an event by Bendis, and it's uh, maybe he doesn't excel at that part uh, of a story, um, then then it leads to kind of something that is just unsatisfying in general. Yeah, because like it's using Age of, Age of Ultron as an example because you brought it up, like that was a book that was very much marketed around, oh, it's crazy, there's a future, and Ultron is a god king, and he's killed everybody, and now crazy things are happening. And that was like the first three issues, and there was cool moments like fucking half vision hanging out inside this tower half vision yeah like these have his torso strung up <laughs> what and, the fuck yeah and, and, <laughs> and he has like all these hoses in them and he's like powering this tower and what stuff the fuck? yeah where's the other half I, that's just a very walking good question. around we'll somewhere? have to read we'll have to wait till age of ultron 2 to find out <laughs> where's vision's legs <laughs> the mystery of <laughs> vision's legs. legs i thought i thought you said hat <laughs> vision that's even oh better that version. would be so much like better <laughs> triple hat from team four yeah exactly oh my god hat vision every time he he gets more powerful. He adds another hat. Adds a hat to it. Oh my god! Next, please make a next oh, event book be Hat Vision. But um, so amazing. But, but that book actually did get a little stronger near the 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 ass half of it when it was all about time travel and Wolverine, and it was lots. Uh, and Sue Storm was time traveling with them. Yeah, th- that was a lot better and more interesting and a, a little bit more reserved. I don't know how you're going to do that with something literally with war in the title that insinuates big, massive scale things. Like, mm. so it, it's it's going it's going to be interesting. And the more interesting part is what is going to be the deeper running theme. We talked about with the original Civil War how it was very much a deep and complex book at just the right time. What point are they trying to make with this book that that Phil K. Dick was a hack? I, I, and we can do his idea better. I I, 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 I don't fucking know. So it, it's it's gonna be interesting. And I don't know. I feel like we we based way too much of this this show about uh, shitting on things we haven't got our hands on yet. <laughs> but uh, welcome to the fucking internet. Yeah, man. exactly. Instead of but, like typing right. behind a desk, we're putting our face to it at least. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's true. <laughs> so yeah, it, it it's gonna be really interesting. And I guess I'm excited. I haven't been excited. Uh, I was a little excited for Infinity just because of the team behind it. But other than that, I really haven't given a shit about a Marvel event book in a long time. AJ, I'd like to yeah. ask you, uh, as far as these Marvel mm-hmm. events go, I feel like the editorial has such... The, 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 the editors at Marvel, they have their hands like deep into these events that how much does it matter what creator is like taking on the event? So Jason Aaron's... Um, he, did he do Axis or was that, that, that Recommender? Recommender. Um, yeah. So, so okay. So so and and then Jason Aaron did the other oh, event. Saying, like yeah. Rick Remender is a great writer. Jason Aaron is a great writer. But those events, um, I, I, as someone who personally has kind of stayed out of those because they're just messy and confusing, and I never hear really yeah. good things about them. You know, th- I those despite those creators, I, I heard that those events were kind of lackluster. So I wonder, you know, even if they got someone like Nick Spencer to do Civil War Two, or you know, just a really great writer who people had a lot of promise in you know how how much of that is, how much of the event is going to turn out to be uh, the creator's vision or how much of it is going to going to be the just whatever the you know uh, marvel corporation wants out of that event. well i i would argue that it's incredibly important because yes the tentpole moments are going to be decided decided by editorial <clears throat> like, like like that's who who dies where is the universe at the end that's set in editorial. All depend. It all okay. depends on what you do with that. Like, look, like, look, like, so it's like look at something like. Uh, let, let's jump the fence for a second, actually, and talk about something like Final Crisis, that was so Grant Morrison. It was. It's like literally the most Grant Morrison thing out there. There's fucking crazy talking tiger people and a god falling through time and breaking it as it goes. Awesome. You, you know, just like the most Grant Morrison thing you could ever possibly read. But the major tentpole thing is at the end of Final Crisis, Batman is dead. That's the editorial point. But that was still one of the best comic books I have ever read because of who wrote it. You could have some putts right that where at the end Batman is dead 
and it wouldn't have anything to do with a god falling through time and breaking time and a bullet punching a guy back through time again and it's fucking with three billion fists we strike you moments like that you know like it, it, that was so important that's yeah. true but but this is Grant Morrison, yeah. and like you can't really like hide Grant Morrison under a blanket. Exactly, exactly. You know, of editorial, it, but uh, and, and that. But there are maybe some. Sorry, go ahead. And that's why WriterBot Five Thousands, like Brian Michael Bendis, I think, kind of struggle with this because so much of what makes Brian Michael Bendis is a small character mo- moments, and he does have pretty. He, he plots things very well, but when he's not allowed to plot things fully, then you're only getting seventy percent Bendis. And okay. but. All right. I've mentioned Infinity twice. I enjoyed Infinity because it was very much a Jonathan Hickman book. And there was crazy deep space science fiction and cities exploding over New York and falling down. And at the end, a guy gets trapped in a giant block of amber. You know, like it's it's crazy. Solid. But the big tentpole moments of that series were, okay, the inhuman city is going to fall and Terrigen Mist is going to get spread everywhere. And at the end, Thanos is incapacitated. But everything in between was, I'm not going to pretend it was a great series, but it was enjoyable because of who was shepherding it. Mm-hmm. And that's because right. that dude has very unique fingerprints. And I think someone like Nick Spencer, who is perhaps not the highest concept gentleman, but he definitely has a style to him. Yeah, he has yeah. a voice, maybe more so than Bendis. Exactly, exactly. Like, like I think Bendis' work is recognizable, but maybe uh, he doesn't have a creative ambition um, to, to go a certain way, uh, uh, you know, a certain Yeah, he style. doesn't quite have as distinctive voice as some of those other guys do. And right. guys like Lemire have a, excuse me, beer is coming. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he definitely has a style to the way he tells stories and sort of a, a soul to everything. He could tell something kind mm-hmm. of interesting. Again, hitting his tent poles. But, like, I imagine a book that he did would be centered around not even a hero, maybe someone who's outside of the conflict. Like, the way he would tell the story would be completely different. So, yeah, um, this post-Secret War universe, I think, is going to take a lot, long time to sort of find its footing. And this is probably the clearest definition of a placeholder event. We need something for summer 16, so here we go. And probably whatever comes next, I think, is going to be a little bit more creatively ambitious. So this is like this is kind of like a preview so. then. Uh, more like a time killer, I would or say. Or an appetizer. Yeah. Let's go with an appetizer. Yeah, maybe this could be the first event where this post secret war Marvel reveals itself to be in any way different from pre secret war Marvel. So seared Mahi Mahi. If it, if it ends up to just be kind of an appetizer, I mean, with that name, Civil War II, they're, they're just setting themselves up for disappointment, which is unfortunate. Yeah, it's I mean, a big I wish, miscalculation, I think. Uh, yeah. It, it really for is. Sure. But yeah. So, uh, anyone else want to say in closing on Civil War II? No. No. A uh, couple more things before we yeah. close this first episode uh, out. Uh, there's a couple things. Again, Rebirth has released a list of titles, but without any creative scenes behind it, how the hell are we going to talk about it? There's a bunch of Superman yeah. books and this new is, Batman. This seems Everyone to be an happy. ongoing trend of, hey, there's things going out, but there's nothing released of it, so let's assume. Yeah, <laughs> there's, so, no, there's no nothing yeah. concrete. Well, outside of Civil War, we can kind of comment on a couple things that Marvel's going to be doing um, besides Secret Wars. The big thing is they seem to be putting a lot of cachet in this new Black Panther series that's coming out. Now, I'm not even going to pretend to think that what I'm going to say right now is close to how it's actually supposed to be said. But the new writer of Black Panther, Ta Naiz Coates, sure, whatever. And uh, this dude is evidently a heavy hitter in circles that are way smarter than I am. And uh, he is a MacArthur Genius Grant recipient. Oh. And National Book Award winner. Like, this is... So he's like... Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And and any time Marvel brings out the... uh, Fucking Scooty and Alex Ross covers, you know that uh, they're serious about a book. So, um, uh, Scooty Young, Alex Ross are doing variant covers. Is is it pronounced Scooty? Or Sco- I don't know. I'm, I, I'm gonna call him Scooty. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, we're gonna call him Scooty. <laughs> there's one. There's one O. Is there not? Yeah, there is. But I'm gonna keep calling Scooty. <laughs> 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 All right. No, let, let's call yeah, him Scooty, Scooty Young. That's, that's, fun, that's a fun yeah. way to say. And it, so. Anyway, there's a lot of excitement, a lot of buzz around this book. I think it's awesome. 
that that legitimate creative talent from outside of comics is finally into comics that has worked in the past i don't remember the gentleman who wrote identity crisis but i know he wasn't a comic book writer and a lot of people hate that series but i liked it um josh whedon which we're going to get to in just a second has done maybe one of the greatest runs in comic book history coming into it cold um kevin smith's done some good stuff mm -hmm. so i always like when people come into comic books and try Brian and try it out. I know yeah, you're well, not. You're not well, a no, I, fan, I, it wasn't for me, but I liked it. it, it I mean, it, it, I, I just didn't read it because, but it was very well received. So yeah, he was very successful there. Um, <clears throat> I'm a little worried, just kind of based off what I know about this gentleman, that it could get a little pretentious and a little bit forward with its message. But again, the man is fucking talented. I'm not going to criticize how he writes because, like I said, well, just it would yeah. be inter interesting to see how it comes. Yeah, out. You, yeah. You can never really. So tell. I'm not sure how much I have to say about that, just because it's going to be. I'll say I'm excited. It, it could be cool, or it yeah, could I'm, it could I'm be excited. a mess too. Um, also, Jeff Lemire, who I've mentioned several times this episode, I'm a big fan of, is taking on a Moon Knight series coming out in April, and that's a character I'm been oh, wanting to hop on to for a long time. And I've heard really was, cool things. Yeah, so yeah. It, I'm not going to pretend I know everything about everything. I'm not, I'm not a big Did of Did you guy. guys read um, Warren Ellis's Moon Knight? I have not. That's on my list. Um, oh, it's, it's so good. It's only the one volume. He did like six issues, but it's it's just fantastic. Well, yeah, and that's why I actually didn't pick it up because I know Brian Wood takes over after him, and I am not a Brian Wood fan, so I need to kind of want to well, get into that. Yeah, but but the thing is with Warren Ellis's run, I mean, just to get through this mm -hmm. really quickly here is uh, like each each issue is kind of its own little vignette, and uh, you're not going to be left wondering at the end of volume one. You're like, oh, where does this go? Because it's just it's just a series of little stories done by Warren Ellis. It's, so it, it can, it's self-contained. Awesome. Well, I'll I'll put that on my list then. Yeah, yeah definitely. I've been wanting it, to get into Moon Knight for a while, and this seems like a great opportunity yeah. in, in Ellis's run. Um, yeah, and sp speaking of Warren Ellis, uh, there's a series that he's going to be coming out with this year called Heartless yeah? with uh, Tula Lote, and it's apparently a Northern English folktale, uh, and, and it's supposed to be kind of have some roots in, in – uh, Horror, and that that's, just sounds super interesting to me. Of very course, not many details. Yeah, but. Warren Ellis kind of scares me with his independent stuff because I've really not liked a lot of the independent stuff he's done. Like, like I know Injection right now is getting a bunch of praise, and I could not get into that series. I, I've, I've liked yeah. a lot of his Marvel stuff, but um, he's kind of in that school with a lot of other guys where I think they're a little bit better in the universe in the universe than out. But yeah, you never know what you're gonna get. I'm, I, but I'm gonna try it. Fuck it. <laughs> yeah, and then there's, there's also from Brian O'Malley, you know, the writer, uh, the creator of Scott Pilgrim. Uh, he's coming out with a series called Snot Girl, um, which is apparently Sex in the City meets American Psycho. What the fuck? Uh, oh my god, I am <laughs> gonna try that so hard. <laughs> what? Yes, and I, I don't, I haven't seen any date for this, but oh um, I, it, it is Image. Um, so, you know, whenever that comes yeah. out this year, I'm very yeah. excited. I, I love Brian O'Malley's work. So. That, yeah, that, that sounds like... That sounds awesome. That, I'm all over that one. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I missed that one in the news cycle, too, so thank you. I'm, yeah. um, the only other thing from Marvel I have that's worth mentioning is... I don't know if any of you guys are reading um, Doctor Strange right now, but it's Jason Aaron, who's very quickly becoming maybe my favorite guy currently working at Marvel. And it's amazing, and we're kind of entering his first big like event in that universe, uh, The Last Days of Magic. And everything about that series has been so cool and so big and just so off the wall. Like, just the way he characterizes uh, Doctor Strange's house as something where, like, every door is just full of nonsense and craziness. And his fridge is, like, just full of, fuck? like, Cthulhu and stuff. Like, it's... It, That's it, awesome. And, and, yeah, and this new... I don't know enough about this Doctor Strange mythos to know if this is a new villain or not. But, like, this group of, like basically robot monster things that are coming to kill magic and like and so it, it's a very cool very exciting I, th that's one of the big runs i think right now that could end up having a place in the history of their character i can't wait so, for that movie yeah, i heard it's fantastic yeah yeah so it's really good and the movie yeah i'm, I'm also, really excited yeah it's I, gonna I, be I, so weird I, I, it comes out later this year and we've seen very little Mm -hmm. uh, nothing, nothing moving. A lot of pictures. Been there, cover That's all I know about it, really. Yeah, and yeah, we'll we'll, we'll right. talk about. Yeah, it. We'll, we'll talk about episode three of this fu this fucking trilogy. <laughs> but um, I yeah, think uh, unless anyone else has anything to add, uh, I, I think episode one of the trilogy is is complete. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. So all you guys out there, thank you so much for spending some time with us, and come back um, next couple days for the video game episode of this 
summer preview. If uh, you're listening to us in our audio version, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, YouTube backslash uh, video game TM. Yep. And the channel is Video Game Time Machine. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at Video Game TM. And make sure you follow me on Twitter at Wisco Kunzi and Cody at Closest Barbecue. Close Barbecue. Close Barbecue? Yep. You changed it? Yeah. Ah, oh, shit. Oh, okay. So you, you can't keep up with me. Dumb to I'm a wild horse. Right. Dumb but different. You put up a horse. Make it more confusing. You put up a horse, I'm going to jump over it because I'm yeah. a fence. <laughs> what? Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Before Cody talks again, we're going to go ahead and get out of here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Levi, make, make sure stop. you subscribe to Levi's channel, uh, Levi Remington, and uh, f- fucking bye. See you soon. Bye. Or bye. <laughs> bye. Just write a book that's the funniest thing in the entire medium while also making it touching and also making it serve as a dissertation on several of the flaws in our modern society and also, you know, just populate that story with charming characters whose relationships unfold and blossom in realistic ways. Yeah, and then, no problem, just take all that and package it up in what is opaquely just a D&D parody book.